the 15th chapter, 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What would cause you to go searching for something? Would you lose any sleep over a lost quarter? Probably not. If you left a $50 bill on the other side of the world, would you hop on a plane and go back for it? No. Because it would cost you more than it was worth. You see, you don't go searching for something unless it is worth it, and its worth determines the amount of time you spend on searching for it. In Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 10, Jesus says, I came searching for the lost, which tells me you and I are God's treasure. We are God's treasure. As we established last week, the three parables in Luke, the 15th chapter, they're a response to the Pharisees grumbling. Should have been rejoicing, but they were grumbling that Jesus eats and receives sinners. We saw how the parable of the lost sheep is for those who are in trouble, know they're in trouble, but are too dumb to get out of the trouble. And we're the sheep. The coin, however, doesn't know that it's in trouble. We live in a world that has a hard time being saved because it does not believe that it is lost. I mean, with the lost sheep, it knows that it's lost. It doesn't know how to get out of the trouble, but it knows that it's in trouble. And so at least it makes some noise, but the coin, nothing. Much of the secular world believes that we evolved from nothing. It does not believe that it's lost uh, or that someone is searching for it because according to the secular evolutionists, we are nothing more than an accident. We are just a hunk of matter with no purpose and therefore no value. Which means there's absolutely no reason whatsoever for saying that you're more important than this hymn book or a rock. If you say your origin is insignificant, then that means your destiny is insignificant. So at least have the guts to admit that your life and everyone else's life is insignificant. And yet every doctor and even, even these same secular theorists will tell you that in order for people to thrive in life, they have got to believe that they are significant. Humans need someone outside of themselves assuring them of their value. A child knows that his catch or her catch was of value when his or her parents are watching and cheering them on. If Taylor is doing something and, and he wants me to see it, he can do it 20 times. And, and if I don't see it, it didn't happen as far as he's concerned. And he's going to say, Dad, Dad. Dad, 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 until I turn and say, what? And he does it. Good job. It's got value. A child, a, a spouse knows that they're valued when their husband or wife is actively committed to the relationship. We know that we're valued by our friends when, when they listen to us and they respect us. You see, we need something outside of us that values us, and the good news is we can have that in Christ Jesus. 
were not some kind of cosmic accident. We were intentionally and we were personally created. And in John 17, 19, notice what Jesus says. He says, for their sakes, whose sake? Your sakes, I sanctify myself. You are God's treasure. And so when the rest of the world sees a cheap old coin, a penny, hallelujah, God sees a treasure. However, I want to challenge us this morning. It isn't just the secular world that does not know its value. Many of us in the church don't think that we're lost either. I should have heard at least a few amens. But we need to remember the context of these parables. Jesus says them in response to the Pharisees and the scribes, grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They're upset because Jesus is hanging out with sinners and not hanging out with them. You see, they don't think they're lost. The coin was not lost in the mountains like a sheep, and the coin was not in a faraway country like the careless son. No, the coin became lost at home. Too many of us become lost at home. We think that because we're in the church, grew up in the church, never left the church, that we're better off than those who are not in the church. But you've got to remember something, church. The coin became lost at home. And there are plenty of people in the church who are hurting, who are helplessly lost. And what's so, what's so sad about it is they don't know it. The Pharisees memorized the first five books of the Bible at a very young age. They numbered their steps on the Sabbath. The title Pharisee means separate ones, basically better than everybody else. The scribes were the teachers of the law. If you had a question about the Bible, they had an answer. But, but sadly, these groups are lost. And what made it even more dangerous is they didn't know that they were lost. And when things don't know that they're lost, they are very hard to find. They can't make noise like the sheep. They're just a coin sitting, covered, alone. Friends, in these last days, we're going to see all kinds of people, I believe, coming into the church. Amen? They're going to be coming in from the highways and the hedges and the byways, friends. Uh, people who knew they were in trouble cried out in their trouble and who Jesus, hallelujah, rescued in their trouble. But I believe that, that our angels and, 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 and heaven is going to be working on some of us saints until the very end, the le very last moment, I finally saved that self-righteous Pharisee. Okay, I'm going to get him. He's going to be working on some of us up until the very end. The person who says, I'm lost, he can save. The person who thinks they're all right, he can't do nothing with. You see, the Pharisees treated everyone other than themselves with contempt. You see, they did not value what it is that God values most. Do you know why we do not treat people in the church like we should? It is simply because we do not value what God values most. Deep down, we don't even think we're worth it. And that's why we keep trying to earn it. You see, we think we're valuable to God because we do this or we don't do that. I don't do this. I don't do that. But you're not valuable to God because of what you do. You're valuable to God because of who you are. You see, when we, when we have that mindset, we think we need to make ourselves more valuable because we don't think we're valuable enough. And that, my friends, is why we can be incredibly hard on other people. We want to know what value they're bringing to the pot. Luke 18. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, thank you that I am not like other men. 
extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. He's adding value. I give tithes of all that I get. He's adding value. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus can save the biggest sinners, but he can't save saints who don't think they need saving. You see, too many of us draw our value from what we know instead of who we know. Too many of us think that, that, that we're holier than those Sunday keepers or those meat eaters or those non-tithe payers. We forget that God did not give those things to us to make our, us more valuable. God gave those things to us in order for us to value the relationship with him more. You see, the fundamental problem for the secular world is the fundamental problem for the religious world. We keep trying to save ourselves, but you can't do it. You're a helpless coin. You're under the coffee table. You're covered in dust. But I've got good news for you. We have a God who searches for lost coins. You're his treasure. He delights in you, not because you got yourself together. He loves you, not because you changed your diet. He loves you because he made you and he gave his life for you. He loves you even in your lost state. You are his treasure. He values you for you. And when you start to realize that, it will change you. And you'll start to find your value in him instead of what you do for him. If you are getting your value from what you do for him, you are a Pharisee. But if you do it because you find your value in him, you're saved. When Isaiah the prophet saw God, high and lifted up, Delane made a very important point when she was talking during praise time. She said, when I look at God's holiness, and she says, wait a second, I can't look at God's holiness. When Isaiah looks upon God's holiness, what does he say? Woe is me, for I am what? We are studying the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost Son, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. You see, Isaiah in that moment is almost undone. He sees his sinfulness in the light of God's holiness, and he becomes to be unra unraveled. He, he knows that he's lost, but then an angel takes a coal from the altar, the place of sacrifice, the place of atonement, and he takes that coal and he touches Isaiah with it, and it changes Isaiah completely. How do we know Isaiah was changed completely? Because of his response to God's request in the very next statement. Right after God touches Isaiah, God then says, look, I need someone who will be a preacher for 30 years to a bunch of people who will never listen, who will never approve, who will never return any tithe, who will never come to prayer meeting like they should. They won't come to the evangelistic meetings. They will show up at the business meetings, but just to complain. If God listed the, the job qualifications in the classified ads, it would have read, uh, someone needed to preach to people who will never hear, never listen, and never approve. And what is crazy is Isaiah jumps up and he says, me, 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 send me. How in the world could anyone do that? I'll tell you how. He saw the altar. He sees the cost of his sins. And in that moment, Isaiah realized his value to God. And if you get your value, listen to me. If you get your value from other people's approval, I want to tell you something. Hosanna's turn to crucify hymns very quickly. 
people's cheers. Uh, you just look at the presidential race. People jumped from supporting one candidate to another candidate overnight. People are fickle. If you get your value from people's approval, you're doomed. If you get your value from your good looks, you're doomed. They will fade. If you get your value from your good works and your good theology, you're doomed because you'll never, ever be good enough. But if you find your value in what God did to find you, it'll rescue you. Look, every other religion, every other God says, here are the rules. I'll wait for you on the porch. But this God comes running off the porch and jumps on the returning sun. This God is the searching woman who does not tell the coins, because this would be completely ridiculous, does not tell the coins, when you're ready and you learn your lesson about being lost, you're going to come find me. How many of us treat, in the church, treat lost people that way? Well, when you get your act together, we may let you in the church. They can't get their act together. They're lost. Bring them into the church. Jesus will get their act together. They're coins, they're inanimate objects. Coins cannot find themselves. We're lost. We cannot save ourselves. But the good news of the gospel is God being rich in mercy because of his great love which with he loved us. That's your value. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, coins made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And so that is what enables Isaiah to become a person who says, I don't really care what you think because I'm treasured by God. I don't really care if you don't like me, God loves me. I don't really care if you don't care about me, I am cared and loved by heaven. And so friends, if you adhere to the secular viewpoint, you'll never know your value because you're an accident. You are a mistake. You never should have happened. And if you're a Pharisee, you'll never know your value because you see deep down you think you've earned your place at the table, but the moment you fall short, and we all fall short, you know you're out of here. Friends, Jesus doesn't say, I'm the horse trainer and you're the horses. He says, I'm the shepherd and you are the sheep. Because you see, horses without trainers, they go wild, but sheep without shepherds die. You will never find a herd of wild sheep. <laughs> you see, sheep need a shepherd. They have to be totally dependent on the shepherd. You, as was so eloquently sung today by Tabitha, you need to depend on Christ alone. The coin's absolutely dependent on the woman finding it. It contributes nothing to its finding. You contribute nothing to your salvation. And your obedience is a response to the salvation. And so God searches for you because you're his treasure, not because you do X, Y, and Z. And when you realize that, he will become your treasure. And then, friends, when Jesus is your treasure, all bets are off. Man, you're good. the sky is the limit. You won't remain the same. But, 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 but you have to learn to trust the shepherd completely. You have to trust the searching, searching woman unconditionally. A few chapters later, these same Pharisees and scribes come to Jesus again. And it's really sad. All this interaction from Luke 15, and even before that, Luke 15, all the way to, to now Luke uh, 20, it's one big appeal from the woman talking to her coins and trying to rescue them. They watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere. There's a whole lot of people in the church who pretend to be sincere. 
because they wanted to catch him in something that he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. Friends, they don't just want Jesus to lose face. They want Jesus to die. And they ask him, is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their craftiness. You see, it's almost impossible. Notice I say almost. It is almost impossible to save something that doesn't know that it's lost and needs to be found. And yet Jesus never stops searching for his lost coins. So notice what he says. He says, show me a denarius. Show me a coin. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they say Caesar's. And he says to them, then render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, one, me and my friend Jonathan were talking about this scripture, and, and he really opened my eyes, and it was just a little insight I had never thought of before, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Often, when we hear this scripture, we hear it in relation to separation in church and state, and it has some relevance for that. But friends, very often when we apply it only to that, we are missing the point of this verse. Essentially, we use this as a verse to say, there's God's stuff, and then there's the government stuff. Just keep them separate. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because listen, when you become property of Jesus Christ, property of heaven, all of your stuff is God's stuff. You don't get to be a Christian in the church and a heathen in your politics. You don't get to say, well, I'm going to adhere to the Republican or Democrat ideals because separation of church and state, and I'm going to ignore the ideals and principles of God. I should have here heard a stronger amen. Amen. Your loyalty is to Jesus Christ, not to anything else. It's to Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying keep the world stuff separate and me separate. It's not what it's saying. We don't get to compartmentalize our faith like that. No, the denarius was inscribed with Caesar's name and it was made with his likeness, but we were inscribed with God's name and we were made with his likeness. And so Jesus was saying, you're my treasure. You're, you're mine. I made you. I'm dying to save you. So give Caesar what is Caesar's, but you're mine. I left heaven for you. You're what I treasure most, the ones that I made in my likeness. And so this world may say you're not worth much, but to me you're worth leaving heaven for. You're even worth dying for. What Caesar is going to do that for you? What government official is going to do that for you? But you know what's sad is not long later, God's church, his bride, very quickly say who they are the property of. You see, eventually the truth will come out. We can come here and play Christian all day, but one day your time of testing will come. And we will see whose property you really are. And so Israel said they were God's property, but very quickly one day, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God's. John Newton was a slave trader. And the slave trade was a terrible evil and blight upon the human race. But during the time of John Newton, everybody did it. You know the story of Amistad, the movie they made about the slave who frees the slaves? Well, guess what? They don't tell you the rest of the story. He goes back and he becomes a slave trader himself. It was so normal during this time. Everybody did it, and I mean everywhere, and it was all around you. It was like a terrible stench, a smell that eventually you can't smell it anymore. But one day, John Newton, miraculously, he renounces the slave trade, and he leaves it. And he ends up mentoring a man by the name of Wilbur, William Wilberforce. 
who abolishes all of slavery in the British Empire years later. Now, how in the world did John Newton change? How did he come to see the value in everybody that doesn't matter what your race is or what your political affiliation is or what your paycheck stub looks like? Everybody is valuable to God. I'll tell you how. He saw his value in Christ. And he wrote a hymn about it. One of my favorite hymns. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. Jesus, my shepherd, husband, friend, O prophet, priest, and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Weak is the effort of my heart and cold my warmest thought, but when I see thee as thou art, I praise thee as I ought. You see, Newton saw himself in Luke 15. He realized he was the lost sheep. He was the lost coin. He realized everyone was valuable to God because Jesus laid down his life for everyone. He was like Isaiah. He got the coal. He, he, he saw Calvary's cross, and it changed him. He saw the shepherd lay down his life for his sheep. He saw his Savior tear up the floorboards and pull out the drawers and, and, and flip up the couch cushions and, and rip off the doors. He saw the king of the universe step off his throne and, and get on his hands and feet and go searching, searching the dirty, darkened alleyways until at last he sees it there in the dark, just a tiny little sliver of light. He sees his treasure. Can you see him searching for you right now? Newton saw it and it changed his life. Isaiah saw it, it changed his life. And I can tell you, if you see it today, it will change yours. Verse 8 says that uh, she lit a lamp and swept and searched. These are the necessary actions to find a lost coin. These are the necessary actions for the church to find lost sinners. We have to light the lamp, we have to sweep, and we have to search. And so I challenge you, keep on preaching the gospel. Keep on praying for that loved one. Keep on inviting that neighbor, that friend to church. Don't ever give up on anyone because Jesus never gave up on you. Don't give up that ministry. Keep on committing to the ministry like that lamp. Sweep and search. Because if you look at verse 8, it says that she sought diligently until she did what? Hallelujah. Jesus didn't stop searching for Richie Halverson until he found what it is he was searching for, his treasure. You're his treasure. You see, we've given these parables the wrong names because we tend to make the Bible about us. Lost sheep, give me a break. More like seeking shepherd. Lost coin, nah. More like searching woman. Lost son, more like running father. You are God's treasure. And when you see how much you're worth to him, you will start to see the value of others and you will start treating people as they ought to be treated. That there are no big shots, there are no little shots. Every sinner in the room was purchased by the blood of Christ. So don't you dare tear someone else down. Instead, tear up the floor to find someone else. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What would make you go searching for something? One thing is for sure, you don't go searching for something unless it's worth it to you. Apparently, heaven thought you were worth it. So make him your treasure today. Give your life to Jesus Christ today. Don't leave this place without recognizing that you're a lost coin. Don't, you can get lost in the church. But hallelujah, Jesus is searching. Let him pick you up, dust you off, and place you back in his purse. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the awesome God that you are. 
that you are the shepherd, that you are the woman who continues to search until she finds it, that you will be searching for us up until the very end. That all we have to do is recognize our lostness and you'll step in and you will save us and through that salvation you will change us and you will turn us into the children you've called us to be that will go from being sheep to shepherds will go from lost pennies to being preachers of your grace Lord, we thank you that even though that coin was not that, would not have been worth it to most people. That even though each person here would not have been worth it, really, for anybody else. For heaven, we were worth it. Because we're your treasure. And Lord, I just pray that each person here would recognize they're your treasure that you love them with an everlasting love. That the lost coins that, that became lost at home in the church will know that they can come to you and be changed by you. Lord, I pray that if there's a person here who feels lost, they know that all they have to do is say, Lord, I'm lost, and Jesus will step in. That even our desire to say that is proof you're already working dynamically in our life. And may they make a decision here in this church, in this place, to surrender all to Christ Jesus. That, Lord, if it's to be baptized, they'll make a decision to be baptized and they'll do it. Lord, that if it's to be rebaptized, they'll do it. If it's just to commit to that ministry or to get more involved or to be committed to being here week after week, because they realize over the weeks, over the months, over the years, they, they've gotten a little lost. Reassure them of your love, that you never leave them nor forsake them. You've always been with them. And may they be embraced by you right now. That the only person who can see us all the way from heaven down to the soles of our feet is the only one who loves us all the way from our soles of our feet back to heaven. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.